Hi everyone, it's Tarrant. And Stella here from Meeple University. Thanks for joining us. Today we'll be teaching you how to play Endless Winter. After this video, you'll be ready to play the game. Stay tuned. Let's learn to play Endless Winter, game by Stan Kordonsky and published by Guff Studios and Fantasia Games. If you find value from this video later, please hit the like button, subscribe to us, hit the bell and leave your feedback in the comments for others to find. For now, let's get to the table. In Endless Winter, each player plays the role of a prehistoric tribe attempting to survive and thrive in frigid Ice Age North America. Players will manage their food, tools and tribe members in order to grow their tribes, develop their own cultures, hunt animals, build sacred stones and mighty megaliths, make offerings, honour the fallen, spread their nomadic civilizations, and settle down into permanent villages. All in the aim of gaining victory points. The player with the most points after four rounds of play will win the game. Place the main board on the table and the round marker on one. Separate the sacred stones into two eras by their backs. Deal one face up into each space which corresponds to your player count, with era one tiles on the left and era two on the right. Return the rest to the box. Find all cards with this back and separate them into 11 piles by their fronts. There'll be four decks of starter tribe cards, each of which has all of the cards showing a certain player's colour and icon on the title. There'll be five decks of general tribe cards, shamans, crafters, hunters, pathfinders and elders, and each of these has exactly the same card 15 times. The rest are two decks of culture cards split into era one and era two. General tribe cards go face up below the main board in the slot matching their icon. The era one and two culture cards are placed in the left column and shuffled face down. Place the culture cap card over era two and deal out eight era one cards in two rows. Each player takes a player board and all their colored pieces, including the nine starter cards and a burial cap card which is placed in this spot of your board. In their slots on the player board, you'll place five camps, three villages, and eight megalith pieces in four stacks of two. Add a stack of two gray megalith pieces to the left slot, and place your resource cubes on zero food and zero tools. Find the five double-sided chief cards and give one to each player at random. This is placed here and the player may flip it to either side, but must choose that for the whole game. Find the matching chief mini and attach your base ring to it. This will represent one of your workers to place in the game. Deal a random setup card to each player and then take the resources shown on it. This will include tools, food, the icon of one of the general tribe cards, which you'll take into your deck, and the icon of one or more animals, which you'll take from the animal pile and place into your animal collection below the board. If it shows a tent, you'll get to place a bonus camp at a later part of setup, which we'll see shortly. Take your starting hand. You'll gain the card that you gain from your setup card, your tribeswoman and your brave, and then shuffle the rest of your cards and draw two more random ones into your hand placing the rest into a face down draw deck. You'll hold these cards face down in hand. Take the player aids matching your player count, shuffle them face down and then deal one to each player. Gain the extra resource shown on the card and place the turn order markers on the track. Also place all score markers at zero. Place one of each player's idle markers on the bottom rung of each side of the idle board. Shuffle the remaining animal cards and then deal face up a number onto the hunting board equal to one more than the number of players. Set up the four pieces of the megalith board and there's a wide variety of configurations you can use depending on your player count. 
Finally, set up the map from all the hex tiles. Separate the base tile, then make a stack of one of each of the six coloured hex types. Add three glaciers to that pile if you're playing with four players, or all six if you're playing with two or three. Return unused glaciers to the box. Gather up and shuffle the rest of the tiles, and then add tiles to the main stack until you have a total of 18. Return any leftovers to the box. Then place the base tile in the middle of the table, shuffle the other 18, and then lay them out in a two ring pattern like so. Each player puts one camp on the base hex, and a player with the camp bonus on the setup card places a second. You're now ready to play. Endless Winter plays in four rounds, which are broken into two eras. Each round begins with an action phase, and players will take turns, a total of three each, in turn order. This is then followed by an Eclipse phase where players will gain their Eclipse benefits and a Preparation phase to set up for the next round. The bulk of the game is in the Actions phase, and when you take a turn, you will take one of your Tribes people, either a General Tribes person or your Chief, and place it into one of the four locations on the board. Then resolve that location from top to bottom. First you'll go into the White Infinite Use section where you can take one or both of the actions in that space as many times as you wish, and in any order. Then you'll move down to the once-off yellow area, and you'll take the action depicted in yellow once. Then, if you're the first player to use this location in this round, you get to take the extra action in the circle at the bottom. All subsequent users take only the top and second actions, and then move down to the picture. In addition to the board action, you can play one or more cards from your hand to enhance your turn, and there are different ways you can do this. At the start of your turn, before resolving anything on the board, you can play one or more culture cards from your hand to resolve the effect on that card. You may play any number of these on a single turn, but for each culture you play after the first one, you must discard another card from your hand. Once you've placed your worker, and started taking the white action, you can't play any more culture cards. As you take the actions on the main board, you'll need to pay a cost for almost all of them, and this can be food, tools, or labour. Food is paid by reducing your food marker, and tools are paid by reducing your tool marker. Labour, on the other hand, can be gained in a couple of different ways. You can spend as much food as you'd like, and for each labour icon you cross, you gain one labour. Or you can play one or more cards from your hand, and gain the labour shown in the top left corner. When doing this, you can also gain the labour from the card's action box, as long as you meet its criteria. The Brave has no criteria, so this card would be worth two and a half labour. The Hunter is worth one labour plus one if you're taking the Hunt action. And the Shaman is worth one and a half plus another one and a half if you spend a tool. You can play any number of cards to get as much labour as you want in this way, but all labour gained must be spent on the same turn that you gained it. It can be split across multiple actions, but there's no way of tracking it from turn to turn, so you must spend it all in the same turn. When you end your turn, all cards you played on that turn are discarded to your personal discard pile. You don't automatically replenish your hand between turns, only between rounds, meaning your hand will dwindle as the round goes on. You may want to keep some cards in your hand for the end of the round as well, as some of them have effects which resolve only in the Eclipse phase. Finally, on the turn when you place your Chief, rather than one of your General Tribes people, you can resolve the effect on your Chief card. And this can be in any order compared with your other actions. Most of the Chief cards have a restriction for which space they need to be sent to, but there is one which does not, and this can be done in any location. We'll now look at how each action works, but first there are three golden rules which apply across all actions. First, your tool and food tracks are limited. 
tools to five, and food to a number which depends on how many camps you have on the board. If you are to gain above that value, any excess is lost. Secondly, your aim in the game is to get victory points, represented by these two icons. The lighter coloured one is an immediate point which you'll track on the edge of the main board, and the darker coloured one is an end of game point. Finally, five of the game's resources and benefits are shown here on the turn order track. At any point during the game, as you are gaining one of these benefits, you can instead cash it in for any single lower benefit on the track. The first location is Initiate, and this is largely about expanding and managing your deck of tribe cards. In the top action, you can spend a tool and a labour to gain a tribe card, meaning you choose any single card from the five decks below the board and add it straight into your hand. That card cannot be played for labour until next turn. If you do this multiple times on the same turn, each tribe card you gain must be different. If any single deck is empty, when you go to gain a card, you can instead choose to gain a point. The second part of the action lets you spend a food to gain another tribe card, and this time it can be the same sort of card as one you took earlier. However, this time it goes into your discard pile instead of your hand. Then, bury one card. Choose any one card from your discard pile, your played area for this turn, or from your hand to place into your burial pile, slotting it underneath your burial cap. This gives you a way of eliminating the weaker cards from the circulation of your deck. And the number of cards you bury will score you some points at the end of the game. The bonus step of this action lets you do a second burial and grants you one idol. Move one of your two idols up one step on its side of the track, and if you're on the right hand side, then place to the right of any idols already on your new step. If you ever enter a rung of the track which has a bonus printed on the right hand side, gain it immediately. If you gain an idol and you've reached the top of the left track, you can instead choose to gain one point. At the end of the game, your position on the left idle track is going to determine how much your leftover resources are worth, and your position on the right idle track is going to determine the points for your buried cards. The second location is Develop, and this is all about culture and worship. In the infinite space, you can spend three labour to gain one culture card. Choose a face-up culture card from those available and add it straight into your hand without replenishing the empty space. If there are none available, gain a point. Then as your one-time action, spend food and tools to gain a sacred stone. The cost is one tool and one, two or three food depending on which slot you'll be filling. Choose any one face-up stone from your current era without replenishing it. And then pay the cost, gain the immediate benefit at the bottom of that space, and then place the stone. The front of the stone has a scoring objective which will trigger in each eclipse. Once you've placed a stone, you cannot remove it, and once you have three, you can't take the action again. The bonus action here is simply to gain a tool and a food. The third location is Migrate, and this is how you place and move camps and villages on the map. The infinite action gives you two options. You can spend a tool to place a camp, and you can spend a labour to move a camp. To place a camp, move your leftmost camp to the base hex in the centre of the map. When you move a camp, simply move that camp to any adjacent hex. There are no restrictions on how many camps can occupy a space, on where you can move, or on how many different spaces you can move a single camp on one turn. As long as you can pay the labour, you can move the camps anywhere in this way. The one-time action here is to place a village, and you must spend three food, and have at least one camp on each of three non-base hexes which share a corner. So here, red can take the action, being on these three hexes sharing this corner, but the others could not, yellow being in the wrong shape, and green being in the right shape, but the wrong place, this corner including the base hex. Remove one camp from each of the three hexes, returning them to your board from right to left, and then replace them with your leftmost village. 
which now occupies the intersection point of those hexes. Villages once placed are never moved, and only one village can occupy a node. The first player bonus here is then to place and move one more camp for free. The benefit of doing this is that as you spread over the map, you'll control hexes which will produce useful points and resources during the eclipse phase. Each hex produces for the player or players who control it. Each camp provides one influence to the hex it's on, and each village provides two influence to each of the hexes it touches. The player with the highest or equal highest influence in a hex will gain the resources in the eclipse phase. The final location is Hunt, and this is all about the game's animals. As the infinite actions, you can spend one labour to draw two cards from the deck face up into the hunting grounds, up to a maximum of six cards, and you can spend a tool and a labour to gain any one card from the hunting grounds. Animals are stored here, and one of their major uses is to collect sets of matching animals to score points at the end of the game, as shown at the bottom of the card. The number of each card type in the 60 card deck is shown in the top right. The one time action when you hunt is to tip one of your animal cards over. This must be an upright animal that you've already hunted, and you'll tip it over and gain the benefits shown here above the score bar in this case for food and placing a camp. Once you've tipped an animal over, you no longer have it. Let's face it, you've eaten it. And it will no longer score its end of game set collection points. But you do keep these tipped cards for the rest of the game because there are some sacred stones which will give you points for certain tipped animals. The first player bonus at this location is to draw a random animal from the top of the deck and add it to your hunted animals. If there are no animal cards left at all when you gain one, then instead gain one point. There is one alternative to taking one of the four main location actions on the board, and that is to rest. And when you rest, you place your worker above the resting space of your player board. Then draw one card from your deck into your hand. If, at this time or any other, you go to draw a card from your draw deck and it's empty, then you shuffle all cards currently in your discard pile to form your new deck, and then draw from that. Then you may also tip one of your animal cards, and gain its resources in the usual way. You cannot play any culture or labour cards from your hand on a turn when you rest. However, if you have a chief who has an ability that's not triggered by the main board, then you can resolve that if you rested with your chief. That covers all of the different actions, but there is one other benefit which you may gain on your turn, which we haven't spoken about, and that is to place a megalith. Take a megalith from your leftmost pile, whether that be grey or coloured, and place it on the board. The first one must be placed on a starting space. Subsequent ones may be placed adjacent to any existing stone, or on a separate starting space, but only if they're grey. When any stone is placed on the ground level, grey or coloured, whoever placed it gains the benefit covered. As the game goes on, you'll be able to start building megaliths upwards instead of outwards, and can place a coloured tile on top of four any other tiles. Grey megaliths cannot go above the ground level. The megalith then scores four points, and each coloured megalith underneath it scores one. So here green would get four points and yellow one. For this placement, yellow would get five points. It's even possible to keep building up, although third level megaliths aren't worth any more than second level. This one would be worth six points for red and one each for green and yellow. Placing megaliths also gives you extra benefits in each eclipse phase. At the end of your third turn in each round, before the next player's third turn, you must prepare your Eclipse pile, which means out of the cards remaining in your hand at this point, you may choose any number of them, and then place them face down into your Eclipse pile. Anything left in your hand is not used in this round, but you'll keep it in your hand for next round. Once all players have finished three actions, the Eclipse begins, and you'll flip over your Eclipse piles and then work out who has the most Eclipse labour. 
add up only the labour in the top left corners of Eclipse Pile cards, plus one and a half labour per resting tribes person from this round. Ignore anything in the action box, and you're not allowed to spend food for more labour in this phase. This would count as four labour. The turn order is now adjusted in order from most Eclipse labour to least, and if there's a tie, reverse the relative order of those players from the previous round. Now in the new turn order, each player gains their Eclipse benefits, and a player gains all of their Eclipse benefits before the next player starts. These are gained in the following order. First, the benefit next to your new space on the turn order track. Second, the Eclipse benefit shown in the action box of any cards you played in your Eclipse pile, and you can resolve these in any order. Third, the Eclipse benefits on any hexes on the map that you control. Remember that means having the most or equal most influence from your camps and villages. And finally, the Eclipse benefits on your player board. For the Sacred Stones, this will be scoring points based on how well you meet their objectives, and so you'll score these stones multiple times through the game. For the Village track, you draw a card for each village, and for the Megalith track, you get idols or tools. Once the Eclipse is finished, as long as there's another round to play, all players discard their Eclipse piles and move to the preparation phase. Retrieve all workers from the board. Draw five new cards into your hand, adding them to anything that was left over from the previous round, and shuffling your discard pile as necessary to add up to five. You cannot trade those five card draws in for lesser rewards. Replenish the hunting grounds until there's one more animal than the number of players. If you're entering round two, replenish the culture cards from the Era 1 deck, if you're entering round three, sweep out remaining Era 1 cards, move the cap across, and then fill from the Era 2 deck. And if you're entering round four, refill from Era 2. After the fourth Eclipse, the game is over and players add up their final scores. Leftover food and tools are added up and score points according to how high you got on the offering track. So this is 10 leftover resources and at a 3 to 1 ratio would score 3 points. The best is a 1 to 1 return and if you never take a step you score nothing. Then score the cards in your burial pile based on your relative position on the honour track. Ties are broken by the player earlier to the left, so here red is in first position and scores the highest number of points. Six points if there's one to three cards, ten if there's four to six, or fifteen if there's seven or more. Second place, even in a two player game, gets the middle amount, and any other players get the lowest amount unless they take no steps on this track, in which case it scores nothing. Then score for sets of untipped animals. The amount of points you'll score is shown down the bottom, and you can only have a single set of each animal type. Here for example, 10 points for having 4 or more slots. The last 2 are wasted. The Argentavis counts as wild in sets, so you could add this here to make this a set of 3 woolly rhinos for 6 points. Finally, look at all cards in your hand, deck, discard pile, or burial pile, and score the endgame points showing on them. The player with the highest score wins, and if tied, whoever was in the higher position in the final Eclipse's turn order breaks the tie. There are two other modules you can add to your gameplay. The first is to use the Glacier tokens to make the glaciers a little bit more profitable. In Setup, shuffle all the Glacier tokens and then place one onto each glacier on the side showing the village. The first time any camp enters or passes through a Glacier Hex, Flip this over and it will show the village benefit for that glacier. Then any time a player places a village adjoining that glacier, the player gains those rewards as an immediate once-off benefit. The other is to use the rest tokens, and this incentivizes the rest action a little bit more than in the base game. In setup and in each preparation phase, you'll flip over the top tile on the rest deck. Then the first player to take a rest action in the round gets the choice to either take this tile or put it on the bottom of the deck and choose the top tile blindly. 
This effect is resolved in addition to the normal rest effects and in any order, and then whether it's used or not, it's returned to the bottom of the pile. These are essentially the equivalent of having one of these bonus spaces on the rest action. And that's how to play Endless Winter. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you find this video useful, please help us by hitting that like button. Subscribe to us, you can also hit the meeple in the corner somewhere there to do so, and hit the bell icon so you'll know when we have new videos. You can also follow me on Instagram for my board games journey. And if you have any questions, comments or feedback, please leave that in the comment section below. Thanks for watching and see you next time.